Well, first, I want to make a general note um, about uh, this lecture and the next five I will give later today and tomorrow. The general themes of all six lectures pertain, pertains to the, to, the, to the state. Modernity, the state first, modernity, and then our systems of knowledge and learning. So basically these three themes. Which is, which is to say that these themes are not only interlinked, but interdependent and overlapping. And so you will find out that one lecture would inform the other. Although this does not happen in any sequential order, this means that there may be things I would say in the last lecture that will annotate or explain certain thing, themes that I advance in the earlier lectures, and vice versa. So, uh, so for it could be the case that a later lecture is the appropriate place to dwell in detail on an issue but the issue would also be of some importance to the themes of an earlier lecture. So it, they are kind of cross-referential. Uh, in uh, every complex society, division of labor in government or in the business of ruling is necessary. Hence the constant presence in one form or another of the executive, what we call the executive branch. Nowadays. The executive is found everywhere in governmental life, either as an integral part of the legislative or the judiciary, or somewhat separate or separated in cases of more democratic rule. The issue is not that the executive executes. This should be taken for granted. Problems arise in situations where the executive executes too much or too little. This too much, the too little, I'm not concerned about. It has its own problems, but they are not of our uh, uh, concern here. This too much, which universally generates lots of anxiety, has two modes. When the executive is given too much power by the legislative, and even by judicial review in, in, in some cases, to implement laws and rules that determine the nature of society and social institutions, that is, to make it and remake it as it wills. And this is going to be a major theme of, of mine today, throughout the and tomorrow. Or two, when it arrogates to itself the powers to do by its own will, to do things by its own will. In other words, it, in, 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 with, with total sovereignty. There is yet another dimension to the executive power that is not conventionally subsumed under the executive. By this I mean the executive as traditionally understood. This is when another competing organ executes outside of the traditional executive. And by this I mean the power of bureaucracy. This phenomenon, this power, is entirely modern and therefore unprecedented, and has been called the headless branch by, uh, by American constitutional lawyers at least, since it is diffused and all pervasive. This has also been described as a constitutional revolution in the practice of modern government, but a revolution that is bloodless and nearly imperceptible, at least in layman's terms. In these senses, execution or the executive is much more porous than we are led to believe under modern theory of separation of powers. The point being that the discourse, the discourse on separation of powers is not as neat as people seem to think. This is one set of problems that any constitutional scholar must reckon with. There are other constitutional problems that may arise and that are not taken seriously among constitutional uh, scholars because the empirical facts that generate such constitutional scholarship or analytical interests are not present. But such empirical facts do exist for the, Islam, for, the, for the student of Islamic history. We have different sets of facts we have to deal with, we have to reckon with. Which is to say that a constitutional approach to Islam must reckon with issues that do not seem to be on the radar or the mind of the modern constitutional scholar. And so a complication arises out of the issue of the subjective identity of the ruler and the ruler. Now, I'm, I'm not interested in the 
in the, in the, in the organization of politics and such things. I'm really interested in the people who make possible politics possible. Who are they as a human beings, as subjectivities, as I will uh, be using in, in, my, in my discourse? And so the complication arises, as I said, out of the issue of the subjective identity of the ruler and the ruler. The ruler being any individual or group adopting any vision of, govern of governance. In other words, does it matter if the subjective formation of the ruler or ruling class differs, say, drastically, from that of the ruled population or aggregation of the ruled, or from the subjective structures of the legislative, for that matter? Of course, I am here not assuming that words such as society or population, about which I will say more later, so that, that terms like society or population are neutral and not organic uh, uh, effect of, of, of a cu cu cultural specific context. So I am, I am not assuming that when I say society, as most people say, they think a society existed all throughout history. My argument is society never existed, as I will explain later, before the 17th, 18th century. The answer to these questions then lies in deciphering the quality of the relationship between the ruler and the law insofar as their subjective difference is concerned. At a similar, a similar fundamental level, there's also the issue regarding what I call creative proximity between the ruler and the, and the law. What kind of relationship governs these two? This relationship can be stretched on a spectrum that ranges from near total separation between the machinery of lawmaking and the ruler to the other end of the spectrum where the ruler himself or itself, if it is an abstract entity, makes and, and enforces the law. In our world today, it is impossible to imagine a ruling machine without this machine having at the same time the exclusive right to legislate. This is why I insist that a modern state that does not legislate is no state at all. But what I want to invite you to think about or imagine is a situation where the effective ruling apparatus does not create, nor does it have any power to create the law of the land. This is a scenario of totally new scenario we need to account for. The second level of analysis here pertains to the subjective quality of the ruler himself or itself. In terms of human agency and constitution of subjectivity, what relationships govern then the maker and executor of the law? Are the agents of the legislature made of the same subjectivity or, or subjective quality as those in the executive? For example, we might ask a question, does it make any difference if the same subjectivity stands behind or does not stand behind both the legislative and the executive? Or what if there are two kinds of subjectivity or subjecthood uh, standing behind them? Think as a hint of Ahl al-Sayf and Ahl al-Qalam, which, which were standard expressions throughout Islam from the, I would say, from the fourth century on. Integral to all these introductory and theoretical points, we are still here, at, still in the introduction. Into, integral to these introductory and theoretical points, we might ask what kind of life conception or worldview stands behind rule and governing. In other words, how does a particular rule, ruling subjectivity see its ontological mission, its mission in life, political life? Is it important to recognize the drastic differences between kinds of rule? A concept of sovereign state, a unitary state with its own raison d'etat, is nothing like theistic democracy, for example. I mean, I'm going to be using theistic democracy to represent the Islamic forms of government. And it's here that we must pay lots of attention. What I want to suggest 
is that the consequences of all the differences I have been trying to bring out between the opposites I have posited are tremendous. To speak of a unitary sovereign state is one thing. To speak of what I call theistic democracy is quite another. I would like to suggest that the unitary state, unlike theistic democracy, does not distinguish between the state apparatus and its citizens. The two being, in terms of subjugation, subjectivation, effectively one and the same. This is the main thrust of Bourdieu's uh, observation that we cannot afford to fail, and I quote, of thinking a state that still thinks itself through those who attempt to think it, as in the case of Hegel and Durkheim. One must strive to question all the presuppositions and preconstructions inscribed in the reality under analysis, as well as in the very thoughts of the analyst. Perhaps it is not out of place to quote Thomas Bernard, also quoted by, by Bourdieu himself on this occasion, as to the organic unity of the state and its subjects. Because despite the hyperbole of uh, uh, Bernard's uh, uh, language, there is a fundamental truth lying there especially if we come to the discussion from the Islamic, Islamic side of things. Bernard says this, school is the state school where young people are turned into state persons and thus into nothing other than henchmen of the state. Walking to school, I was walking to, into the state and since the state destroys people, into the institution for the destruction of people. The state forced me, like everyone else, into myself and made me compliant towards it, the state, and turned me into a state person, regulated and registered and trained and finished and perverted and dejected like everyone else. When we see people, we only see state people, the state servants who serve the state all their lives and thus serve unnatured, unnatured all their lives. End of quote. This is, of course, hyperbolic. No, can, no one can doubt this. But it tells of the beginning and end of a story, a story that goes deep into the social and psychological makeup of what we can comfortably call social order. Of course, the law begins to serve the ends of power in the creation of productive and docile citizens, the first of these being tied to an unprecedented capitalist system and the second to a regime of national state where the population is the site of management and, and, and control. But we must be mindful that juridicality, meaning the use of the law, is not the only means by which such management happens. There is a whole system of normativity that is always at work to decipher the normal from the abnormal. A system of normalization, of uh, abnormal, ab, uh, normalizing, abnormalizing, that is tied not so much to the law, but mainly to science. This field of activity related to the health of the population, the nation, in ways that subjugates this population to the normative and so-called normal standards of care. We can see this nowadays in clear play in the United States, with the CDC and FDA pronouncements, as well as those of experts such as Dr. Fauci and the science experts. Foucault has shown the operation of this disciplinary scientific power in the 18th century in the context of sexuality and normalization of it at the hands of the scientific community. I'm also taking the familiar story of schools, hospitals, and police departments for granted, not to mention the power of social agencies and social work forces uh, uh, of, the, of the state, not only in managing society and the population, but also together with the force of the law of re-engineering the family and thus society at every turn. This is, by the way, 
what I mean by the ideological complexity of such terms as society and population. And so the rise of these disciplinary forms of power coincides historically <clears throat> with the expansion of the human sciences, which are made to serve as the legitimating discourses of this new form of power. These sciences shape knowledge and expertise, and so they operate not as a code of law, but as a code of normalization. Yet law and science cannot be separated from each other as active agents of what Foucault called biopolitics. Foucault argued that these two forms of biopower, discipline and regulation, became largely united in the 19th century so as to create the great technology of power in that century, which pushed the limits of all human capacities. This required the mechanization of bodies and vast and a vast collective body of the willing subjects. What is heavily involved here is also ideological capitalism which involved the insertion of bodies into the machinery of production and the adjustment of the phenomena of population to economic processes. Biopower, therefore, seeks the consistent enhancement of the forces of life in society without incurring any significant loss of control over these forces. That is, power in the service of vitality, dynamism, economic health, etc., etc all of which is geared toward the health of the population, itself now being presented as a new concept of science, nationalism, politics, and much more. All societal institutions, from the family and the church to the educational system, the university, health, family, the military, and others, normalize, structure, optimize, and at once subordinate the individuals to the machine of the economic system to make them productive members of society, the national subject, who will happily defend it to the death if necessary. The ironic, but also the radical example of this is the African-American subject, and I mean subject, who enlists in the army to fight with a likely possibility of incurring death to, the, to defend his nation, his culture, the American way of life, when in fact, it is this very way of life, his nation and his country, which subjected him to almost unprecedented cruelties for centuries and deprived him of the very basics of a human life. This is a huge irony to me and has always stood as one. Well. Life, bio-life, thus becomes enshrined in the realm of the political, that is, in a political, scientific, and secular cosmology that claims major departures in the form and content of government from anything that came before. In Europe itself, but also elsewhere. This entire process begins in the 17th century, develops in the 18th, and matures in the 19th. But this time, there was an identity between the subject of the population and the subject of the state. Be he the politician, the bureaucrat, the administrator, or the officer. This process, then, is European and new, even to Europe itself. That is why I'm, 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 I'm mentioning centuries, because I want to make clear that these developments uh, happen in a particular period in a particular place, and we cannot universalize them and generalize them across uh, human history. I shall not dwell here on the significance and ramifications of this kind of cosmology. Although we can find, it, find in it a dramatic difference from other cosmologies. One can speak of biopower as a mode of governmentality that not only controls all areas of life, but also one that exists for its own sake. <clears throat> in other words, one can speak of a cosmology without a telos, without an end, without a goal. If biopower, at the end of the day, exists for its own sake, without a truly existential meaning, other than control for the sake of, 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 of order, power for the sake of power, then it is engulfed, like capitalism and much else that constitutes biopower, by irrationality. Or at least, one can say, 
it is involved in a project that does not know except itself. Furthermore, and one final but crucial point, is that biopower represents itself through discourses that mask the inner and underlying relationships that make it what it is. In other words, it is an essential feature of biopower to represent itself in forms of truth other than what it really is, which is the truth of the truth of biopower. Masking and misrepresenting is an excellent question and certainly one of the most fruitful areas of research. For an answer to it, a proper answer to it, will reveal so much of an alternative truth that might render biopower's legitimacy uh, suspect, to say the least, and to put it mildly. Yet, despite the tremendous importance of this area of research and the promise of monumental discoveries, it has received little attention, and this by a relatively small number of scholars. For it might just turn out to be the case that none of biopower's ends or purposes squares well with, that, with the good life, the ethical life, or the meaningful life. But these are philosophical questions I shall not pursue here, although I must uh, underscore the fact of silence, of the silence of the scholarship, which itself is constitutive of the mask itself. That's why it is a mask. Now, what needs to be emphasized is that by recognition of all, this is a modern phenomenon which is to say that it is an integral feature of modernity, unprecedented anywhere. It is the product of the state, the modern state, modern science, and nationalism. It is the product of the displacement by man of God and the enchanted world, and the life now devoid of any mamundi. When we speak of the relationship between power and the law, or between the state and the population, or of any form of governance in the non-European world, then we must remember that all this conceptual bagage we use for the state and its relationship to the law and the so-called population is uniquely European. Yet we know no other language to speak of anything else. Anything that is different or very different from what is a second nature to us. This alone should make us pause and ask whether or not we even have the right language, the right tools to engage in such, in such historical studies. For our language is saturated, indeed totally formed, by linguistic conceptions that are exclusively planted in a particular epistemological and ontological political reality. It is in many ways like using the travel language pertaining to airplanes and modern airports in all their technological, administrative, and procedural complications to describe and analyze travel by caravan or by horse. I must stress here that this metaphor does not involve passing judgment on one advanced form or another of travel or another. Travel by camel has its own complex forms, I assure you. Rather, my point here is exclusively about the inadequacy of our language for historical narration. We simply do not have this, this language yet. And more importantly, we commit a grave historiographical and thus epistemological error when we so comfortably harness modern language and modern conceptual categories to describe the habitus of an earlier society or culture. If it is true that modern power produces its own regime of truth, then it is also true that the discourse of that regime is either unfit to describe anything else, or worse, that that discourse is also designed to create particular ideological, heavily ideological truths about other systems, whether they are historical or not. In other words, the vocabulary and grammar of our narrative is either useless for engaging in historiographical studies and historiography generally outside of that regime of truth or that it is deliberately prejudicial to a description and analysis of other competing regimes of truth.
In either case, we are left to our own devices. We therefore must start from a blank state, so to speak, perhaps leaving the entire conceptual framework that our modern condition has bequeathed to us. We no longer can use words such as state, bureaucracy, democracy, freedom, liberty, society, population, religion, territory, even the very expression of separation of power, and much else to describe or engage any period of history before the 18th century. Especially if we are talking about the, 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 the Asian, African, or other worlds, non-European worlds. We must therefore start from the point of our concerns, from the very conceptual repertoire of the time and place of our intellectual interest. We must give special attention to the translation of every central concept with full awareness of the potent biases that our normative systems of value and knowledge entail. Which means that we need to see ourselves from the outside as if to diagnose our own problems, our own pathologies. Here, I do not mean by translation the basic and normal meaning of the term, the basic and normal operation of translating, but I rather gesture toward the complex issue of how to transmit a concept to a modern reader whose intellectual faculties are limited by severe ideological paradigms, the discursive and ideological masks I have been speaking about. The concept must be fleshed out by means of terms and notions that are native to the context and semiotic and genealogical background of that scientific concept, so as to minimize what might be called foreign, presumption, foreign presumptive intrusions that impede rather than help clarity of thought. Now, let me say a few things about why we need a new approach for the study of Islamic governance. One can say, in the first basic step, at a minimum, that studying drastically different phenomena requires different methodologies and different ways of analysis. In fact, something like this requires subtle methodological attentiveness as to the Im implications of using the same toolbox to accomplish drastically different tasks, including the analysis of diff differing uh, phenomena and different phenomena. It is as simply as saying that you cannot accomplish the task that requires a diamond cutter with a carpenter's saw, or a car mechanic's wrench with a wood carving chisel. And this is only to be, through this metaphor, only to be kind to what's happening really now. Mm. The first thing we need to realize about Islamic governance is that Islamic polity was not unitary. I will say a lot about this later on. Certainly not in any way similar to the modern nation state. This is the main effect of what I was trying to show in the opening of this lecture. If the modern state produces its subjects, and no reasonable person can deny this, then here stands the first major difference, which I state emphatically. Islamic governance was not unitary, and furthermore, being our, ourselves state subjects, we ought to appreciate the full scale of this epistemological challenge. I will have a lot to say about this, as I said, in the sixth and last lectures, in the, in the sixth and last lecture, for now I am I'm just attending to historiography, because it has many, the, the problem has many dimensions. I'm only attending to the historiographical now. Later on I will have to attend to it from a different perspective at least. And so there were primarily two divisions of, go of, gov of governance or government that stood apart from each other in drastic ways. That is in Islam. The native vocabulary used for this is, as I said before, Ahl al Qalam and Ahl al Sayf. The latter, Ahl al Sayf, being the executive and the former being everything else. And it's important to kind of to say everything else. It's not, uh, it's not, it's intended. It is by design that I, I formulated the language this way. 
But mainly the law, the 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 أهل أهل القلم and and everything else. But mainly they are the 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 lot of mujtahidun and their ilk of of various ranks because the the mujtahids were of various kinds uh, ranks. Uh, and on the other hand, the adjudicative personnel as part of 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 this أهل uh, القلم. Who are the qadis, katibs, and and others? Uh, the picture is varied and very detailed and complex. Uh, I usually teach it in my uh, seminars on, on on the Sharia. These two divisions were very different from each other. However, much they shared in terms of cultural habitus, about which I will have a few things to say later. The second feature to note, in light of what I have just said, is the considerable autonomy of both the sultanic executive and the legislative. First, and before we one proceeds to describe the competence of each division or branch, let me say that we need here a new language of description. For example, the designation legislative branch or legislative power is not apt at all in the Islamic context. Although I am prepared to use sultanic executive for what executive function the dawla, for, the, for, the, for what the dawla has done what it stood for. The expression legislative branch is inaccurate for more than one reason. First, the term branch is not apt at all since it belongs to the unitary state. It's a branch of something, which Islam did not know until the end of the 19th century. What is involved here is not a branch, but a sphere, a province, a domain of both law and culture. The Sharia was not a branch of anything unless we consider Islamic cosmology to be the stem or the tree. But it's, cosmology is not an institutional concrete matter. Cosmology is, is, is ideas. And so I wonder, the Sharia is a branch of what? But the Sharia is not a branch of any political body or even a polity. For to say that it was a branch of a polity is to say that it was engulfed by that polity or that it stood in a unitary relationship with it. But my point is precisely the opposite. Moreover, the mujtahids and great jurists did not legislate but interpreted the scripture and came up with aqwal or simply opinions. However tightly and often impeccably these were argued or reasoned. It is of crucial importance for us that there was no one law in Islam, not single legal voice, as it is the case with the modern state. Even about one and the same thing, issue, every, as we, many of you know, every single question, mas'ala, in the fiqh has at least two, three, four uh, opinions, sometimes 10 and 12 and more. There were only opinions. Much of these would match or outdo in intellectual rigor and legal terms what we consider today sophisticated legal reasoning by leading justices of the higher courts. Yet none of this is positivist, for the act was not legislative. And that's my point. It was not legislative either formally or substantively. The legislative is exclusively organic to popular will or the fiction of popular will. Depends how you want to read popular will. Furthermore, the space that the modern legislative occupies is much narrower than its Islamic equivalent. The Sharia was not merely a legislative and judiciary function, but a whole culture writ, writ large. The Sharia and its personnel did not merely discover the law but in fact created a culture of values that sustained the entire social and economic world, not to mention the spiritual and psychological. And with the rise of Sufism, that psychocultural domain of value was deepened further, thereby, thereby absorbing the habitus of the sultanic executive increasingly, as we can see clearly in the gunpowder empires. The gunpowder empires are the ones that came after the 14th, the beginning of the 16th century, basically, with the, with the, with the Ottomans, Timurids, and uh, the Safavids. So we are talking not just about the production of legal value, but rather about the production of cultural value 
in the widest and thickest sense of the word. The culture of the Sharia, of the Sharia province or domain, took over and colored the culture of the executive, not the other way around. And the evidence is, is massive. The benchmark of value and social judgment was not dynastic, but rather Sharia. And so this benchmark was dictated by the habitus, which is the definition that, uh, that on which everyone agreed. The habitus is, is the normal state of things, the normal way of doing things. If I say here, inshallah, uh, no one here will, 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 will wonder what is this word. It's taken for granted. We exchange it as a matter of course. Now, from the way law was discovered, quote unquote, we know that the law of the land, the default law of Dar al Islam, is the Sharia, which permitted within its purview a space of administrative regulation. And in fact, much else. I argue that on average, and even in its highest and most complex form, namely the Ottoman, this administrative regulation falls by far short of anything we call administrative regulation today. If we are willing to continue to recognize our popular legislative will as the foundation of liberal democracy, despite what has been called, quote unquote, administrative bloodless revolution, then we ought to recognize the Sharia as the law of the land without qualification. The third feature to note, and I will finish in less than a minute, the third feature to note, which stems from the second, is the limited relationship between the executive, the profane, mundane, earth, earthly, political, and military power, and the legislative. The separation between the two was profound, if on no other basis than the difference in the training, subjectivation, general cultural commitments, and worldviews of the two sides. Most importantly, the civic population or the Foucauldian population of biopower was, in the case of Islam, quite separate and detached from the executive. I will return to this and continue my argument in the next lecture, inshallah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Okay. All right. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah. Uh, I am an August company. I grew up reading President Halak's books starting in my undergraduate. So speaking next to him um, is both a great honor and intimidating for me. Um, meeting him last night for the first time, uh, I was uh, just uh, extremely pleased by his warm and an open personality, we jumped right into uh, our life stories and our work, and, uh, and when we have, can we continue that over breakfast, and it's hard to uh, express that uh, warmth and, and candidness that, that I've experienced. And what I will do here is slightly different, uh, perhaps, from what I had intended earlier. I will start uh, my introductory remarks uh, slightly differently, differently from Professor Halak's. I will not jump right into it, but rather I will talk about the phenomenon of uh, Wild Halak, of the impossible state, and, and then talk a little bit about, try to restate the thesis of the Islamic State, um, and then invite, invite you all to, uh, to take it apart, and take it apart, keeping in mind uh, the further bolstering arguments that Brother Halak has provided here. Um, so first of all, uh, Professor Halak's work over the last decade and a half, of which the impossible state uh, is the most well-known, has been a watershed, uh, as it has marked a shift in discourse around the Sharia and the modern state. This recognition is rather banal in the field. Everybody knows that, and that's why you're here. And many such works are authored. Um, in many works that, that claim to have changed the field are, are, are authored, many uh, 
every year. But the global impact and authority of Western scholarship on Islam, uh, many Western works shape the policymakers in all kinds of trends and movements across the Muslim world. Halak's work has done even more than that. Halak's work has gone beyond policymaking circles or elite circles. Last I heard, it is being uh, read and discussed and debated um, in circles at Al Azhar University or among Al Azhar graduates uh, and, and elsewhere. So it has become a phenomenon. Now, whether people understand it and to what extent people appreciate it um, and are able to critique it fairly, that is the question that I think we're going to get more into today. Um, as is often the case with genre bending works, its impact was more deeply felt outside the circles of specialists, historians, and political theorists of Islam. Alak's work has been transformative um, in, I will mention, a few uh, ways. Its translation into Arabic to readers who were otherwise unfamiliar with his work and the shifts in the broader Western canon has turned, into, turned it into a singular intervention in the Arab Muslim discourse. <clears throat> Al Jazeera has done many episodes on, it, on, on him and there are many uh, popular public intellectuals in the Arab world who are passionately for or uh, against it. Uh, this readership of Western scholarship in the Arabic, uh, in the Arab sp Arabic speaking world, which is rising uh, very quickly within the last decade, this phenomenon of translation um, is as it's uh, uh, materializing. But it received Professor Halak's work without the benefit of knowing his, his previous work, the context, and without also the benefit of knowing the current work that is being done in the Western Academy. And that, I think, was especially interesting in how uh, it created, uh, it came out actually, the book came out in 2013. And for many people who are just coming out of the Arab Spring, they thought the impossible state was an explanation of what happened to them. And so it was then received with this special passion there are people who are saying, we told you it was impossible what you're trying to do. What happened to you was well-deserved and, and, and ordained. And uh, similarly, those who felt uh, targeted and were in fact targeted politically or politically frustrated felt that this was a direct, against, a direct attack on Islam or the idea of Islam and politics and so on. To give a sense of uh, how Arabic Muslim, Arab Muslim scholarship, particularly in Egypt, which is really central, culturally speaking, uh, Egyptian Qatari Muslim scholar, Sheikh Yusuf al Qaradawi, uh, has cited and reacted to translations of Bernard Lewis's works since the 70s and 80s. And in other words, Western understanding of Islam, which often is absorbed and, and, and identified with, was understood through the writings of the Doan of the Middle Eastern Studies, as he's called, Bernard Lewis. And um, what Professor Halak's work is doing is effectively saying to the Arab Muslim scholars, uh, Arab intellectuals is that there is another narrative of what Islam is out there in the West and it's much more likely that the next generation of, uh, of Yusuf al Qaradawis would have read whether agree in agreement or in disagreement but nevertheless would have read and absorbed and reacted to uh, Allah's work. Even in the Western Academy, Professor Halak's work during the last decade and a half um, has effected a significant transformation. Not only because his provocative, pr provocative claim is eminently teachable, uh, but because of his 
really three decades of scholarship prior to that, uh, assigning halak in uh, works on Islamic law or Islamic legal history or even works of Islamic philosophy, one took that for granted. I experienced the Western Academy starting in the late 90s and then wrestled with the frustration of a self-assured Western colonial gaze when the standard narrative on Islam was still dominated by icons like Joseph Schach, Bernard Lewis, Wansboro, Patricia Crona, Cook, and so on, in a moment when intense expansion of Islamic studies in Western universities, even before 9-11-2001, was beginning to change the view of the subject matter from the trenches. What I mean by trenches is the work that Islamic studies graduate students do the actual scholars working in the field whose work is usually inaccessible to the public outside. What they do and what people like Bernard Lewis write about what's happening in the field, there is usually a major difference, just as much of a difference as, you know, if you were to go and tell a story of what's happening in a war and who's winning, you go to the trenches, you hear one story, and you go to the general who's explaining to the world what's, ha what's happening, they're completely different, sometimes completely uh, opposed to each other. And that's really what has been the case in uh, Islam, uh, Islamic and Middle Eastern studies for a while. Um, Halak's earlier work on legal history and legal theory were part of the scholarship in the trenches that was already moving the needle. And uh, the, most, the most important work, I think, where one begins to see a significant uh, change in this new direction is not with the impossible state, but with the hefty volume on the Sharia called the Sharia, which is a survey, first half of it is a survey of, of a traditional Islamic fiqh manual on everything, including things that we typically now no longer study, such as jihad and and slavery and whatnot, but also then the last half is what has happened to uh, that knowledge uh, over, the, over this course of, of the colonial period and post-colonial state. This work theoretically prefaced the impassable state. Drawing on the scholarship in the trenches, as well as from other more inward-looking and self-critical advancements in certain academic disciplines outside of Islamic studies, such as history, anthropology, critical theory, philosophy, subaltern, and decolonial studies, this project began to challenge this picture of Islamic studies at the public and pedagogical level. This was no mean achievement. And uh, it is today when I teach a graduate course on Islamic law or Islamic political thought. I do not have to, to start with Shah, and I do not have to talk about uh, you know, Goldsey or Wandsboro. I do not have to explain that the Quran was written, you know, was not written perhaps in the Abbasid period, and maybe it can go back to its, you know, uh, when, when it claims to be, or that uh, the Hadith are not all bad projections and so on and so forth. One could rather s start talking about something entirely different. One can start saying, is Sharia better than the modern state? Are you not frustrated with the modern state? Is it not worth for us to start thinking about the Sharia? Uh, not as part of an account of what went wrong, but rather what we could be, what we can do. That drastically changes the narrative. Even if, of course, once you get into the trenches, you find that the problems uh, still uh, confronts you that are very significant and that we're going to they going to talk about. Let me in the remaining few minutes simply restate then the key thesis of the impossible state as I read it. First The impossible state says, and I'm now, now I'm going to refer to the book rather than Professor Halak, uh, 
because I'm going to specifically talk about the development in particular texts. The impossible state argues, first, that the modern state is amoral. Not immoral, amoral. Constituted for its own sake. That is the purpose of existence of this new entity, which has not existed in history in its form, is amoral. It is not there to do good or bad, it is there to exist and to uh, self-perpetuate. Whereas the Islamic order is constituted by a primordial moral commitment. And the way I like to explain it to an Islamic audience, a Muslim audience, is God who created life and death in the same sentence in order to test you whether you do good or, good or evil. So the purpose of creation and the normative uh, command, right? So, so the fact of creation and the purpose of creation come together in one package. And the Islamic State, the Sharia, is an expression of this uh, sort of uh, conjoining of a reality uh, of why, why do we exist. Whereas the modern nation state starts with the fact that we exist and then it says morality is something that I will let you choose, I will let you decide, or perhaps I will give it to you. Whatever it is, but it's a secondary question, a separable question. So the Sharia is born with a primordial moral commitment and a, uh, any, any governmental formation in Sharia uh, has to inherit a law and a moral order prior to itself. It doesn't create it, it doesn't give it. Second, the modern state is essentially political. That is, it is constituted by self-referential power for precisely the same reason that it is amoral, whereas the Islamic order is moral, constituted primarily by a moral commitment to God, truth, and God's creation, and is not political in that it is not constituted essentially or paradigmatically by power. It is political, at least in my view, but in a secondary sense, or as Professor Halak's book would like to, this uh, impossible state says, the central domain of the Sharia is moral, even though it has other elements as well. Whereas the central domain of the modern state is political. Third, these statements about creed, about theory, about ideals, if you will, are once properly stated, not contested by either side. And as such, history for the impossible state, history is merely a manifestation of these facts, not a site of their constitution in the sense that the Islamic order is constituted by a religious belief and its, and its first actualization is in a community of faith, the Ummah, in which the political state, territory and authority are secondary. Conversely, as an agent of secularism as well as perhaps the result of secularization of, of Western Christendom, the modern state is, by its very creed, a non-religious state. This may explain, in my opinion, the limited reference to history in all three books that we're going to talk about today. Even though a detailed engagement with history of law and colonialism can be found in Sharia, the book before the impossible state. Now, two kinds of problem are, problem are created in theory for the narrative of the impossible state. First, the intrusion of politics in Islamic history, such that the original religious moral commitment is subordinated to power struggles in Islam, thus requirement, requiring an engagement with Islamic history to defend the Islamic half of the original thesis, meaning that, Islamic, uh, that the uh, Sharia is primarily moral, if that is the case, then why, do, do, why does one find so much politics? Why does one find 
sometimes not only immorality, but perhaps amorality in Islamic history. That is a challenge. The other, the intrusion of moral and religious concerns in the secular state. Thus requiring, requiring, requiring an engagement with the modern Western history to defend the Western half of the original thesis. Meaning that the modern secular state, one might say, uh, and I suspect that Professor Halak will say, has rewritten morality in order to define itself as being moral. But nevertheless, uh, morality, the concern for human rights, uh, the concern for eliminating poverty, the concern for uh, e uh, giving equal rights to its citizens, those are concerns that nevertheless bother, uh, constrain the actions of modern state actors. Now, when read alongside the prequel Sharia, um, this objection is at least partly answered. Whether it is satisfactorily answered or not, that is something um, that's a different question that we will be wrestling with today. How much time do I have? Just finish off. We've got plenty of time. All right. Four more minutes? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. So, Professor Halak's denial of politics in classical Islam has often been identified as one of the weak points of his arguments, even though it is premised on a very peculiar Schmittian understanding of politics. It may be based on his construal of the modern state as essentially political, which makes the rule of law a uh, lost idea or an impossible idea. It's rule of politics. In other words, the rule of law becomes impossible in the modern state just as the rule of politics becomes impossible in the Islamic order. But is this law good versus politics bad dichotomy necessary to make an essential point? Doesn't rule of law serve the interests of the status quo and the capitalist elite in the same way as politics and executive privilege in the modern state? I submit rather that the middle chapters of the impossible state could just as well have been about the story of how the law of corporations as persons, for instance, and how the uh, rule of such law in fact enables and empowers the worst impulses of corporate capitalism, and that arguably it was law-protected capitalism that ran amok in the early part of the 20th century in, in America, and that it was politics, for instance, in the form of FDR's New Deal, that saved democracy and capitalism from, from its worst impulses. Instead of arguing about rule of law as the linchpin of good governance, one could argue that political limits on capitalism are necessary or have been necessary to save both. My point simply is not either to defend capitalism or modern institutions, but simply to say that I don't see rule of law as being particularly uh, a, a particularly important guarantee of good government. In the um, and the absence of politics as necessarily necessarily a virtue, and uh, one could often argue that. The opposite could be just as well true as in FDR's example. In fact, the surprising absence in the impossible state is a chapter on capitalism. Of course, there is a chapter, chapter six is on globalization, but it's rather short, and it doesn't quite get into how uh, economy uh, sometimes it could, multinational corporations today, for example, are much bigger than states. The big, biggest economies and biggest power-wielding organizations today are not states, but, but economies, but multinational corporations. And of course, he acknowledges that in his um, in his a number of references, but that makes the emphasis on the state 
uh, somewhat puzzling for me. Because I would argue that capitalism is far more directly responsible for the destruction of the environment, the family, the community, and peace than the executive overreach of certain administrations. Um, and one could easily argue, as certainly scholars have, that it was the Islamic prohibition of usury and other limitations that kept capitalism from developing in the realm of the Sharia. And you could think of Islamic prohibition of, of usury as a political limit on, uh, on where economy would naturally go. And so this is not, uh, you know, and this is of course open to interpretation, but my point is, um, that there is the role of state in Islam has to play in order for the Islamic free market economy to uh, and to to flourish and and, and, and not develop into uh, another kind of capitalism. There's much to suggest that Professor Halak is deeply concerned with the havoc wreaked by corporate capitalism, but the structure of his case is directed against only half of that of the whole that makes up colonialism, Cold War and now globalized form of modernity. In each of these phases, especially the first and the third, that is colonialism and then globalization, the economy led the politics and not the other way around. This gap in the argument may not be filled by simply adding another chapter, uh, but might require a more multifaceted critique of the forces of modernity and one that looks not only at the nation state but simultaneous, simultaneously at the economy. And I'll stop you. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Okay, so we're going to open up for questions and answers. Uh, yes, Siddhartha. Just two questions, and I'll. Uh, and it's it's absolutely fine if uh, if you choose to answer some of these in the break time and later in the day. But first of all, I know that I I I think I understand what you're speaking of when you speak of the fact that in pre-modern Muslim systems of governance and societies that there was no unitary law. But can we, can we really say that the evolution of Islamic law was untouched by tyranny and was untouched by the way executive power was wielded since the time of Muawiyah you know, in, in Islamic history? Can we really say that, that the evolution of Islamic law was, was um, untouched and unaffected by that? The other question is, of course, we're, we're dealing with a problem. We have discourse interrogating discourse, so we have a, some reflexivity going on here. But would you say um, that Muslim perceptions of the Sharia as a monolithic system of law, and, and I'm just I'm saying that not as a definition, but as a perception of the way it can be perceived in some societies, can you say that Muslim perceptions of the Sharia have been irreversibly affected and tainted by the colonial experience? And, and that the exposure of European ways of speaking and categorizing aspects of society and governance, that, that these, these have now rendered even Muslim perceptions of Islamic law irreversibly uh, tainted and changed? And so, so I guess the question really is, is is a decolonized discourse now even possible? Or, or is, you know, when we talk about what is better, Professor Anjum, do we even know what we're talking about? If we cannot clearly even conceive of the alternative because of our language and our categories of thought have been so irreversibly affected, can we even ask that question in a clear intellectual way? Those are the two questions. Can, can I... Uh, uh answer the, the first question and uh, with it also the, the remark uh, uh, of my good colleague here about the, the, the rule of law. I, I want to preface uh, uh, to, to the answer to both uh, issues I'm going to merge them together uh, with, with, with the uh, remark about a methodological point I raised in the possible state about the so-called benchmarks. Mm. Uh, benchmark uh, is, 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 a, is a particular uh, um, uh, uh, agreement or uh, uh, communal agreement on a particular level of behavior that is deemed to be uh, ideal, but not ideal in the sense that it is impossible to achieve, but close, almost, almost impossible to achieve. But still, it's a human idea. 
meaning that if you do enough, you will reach it. Mm. So it is possible, but difficult, let's put it this way. This is what I call, I call this a benchmark, and under the benchmark, there's the problem of, of something that can be characterized as the asymptotic challenge. It means that that's like ishtihad. You, you do it, ishtihad, you do your best. It's not guaranteed that you will reach this, but you, you keep, keep challenging. لِنَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا was taken very seriously and was paradigmatic in terms of behavior everywhere in the Sharia Sufism, in every domain I have studied in this. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, this, this is a methodological issue. Uh, this should be always kept in mind when we want to compare systems like, for example, the Islamic system or the modern system. We need, we need to be careful not to confuse this benchmark with actual events of life. In other words, we cannot compare apples with oranges and, and, uh, and oranges with apples. They need to be separate. Now, tyranny, to begin with your, your question. Tyranny uh, is, 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 is something that, 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 um, that has plagued every period of human history, including modern democracies. If we were, in, in I, I am sure in 20, 30, 40 years, historian would be writing the history of the United States and marking the Trump era at least, not to mention others now, as a, a very sad, bleak history uh, part of the, or episode in American life, as actually one that in fact was dangerously close to not only tyranny, but in fact worse. Many people feel the worst, as we all know, right? So, in, 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 we cannot take we cannot take the constitutional structure of Islam, however it was defined, and compare it with the with with, with or consider the attitude of bad sultans and caliphs to be defined with that picture. In, the, in we have in the United States and Europe, we have a certain model for governance that actually very rarely that we really conform to its idea. Mm -hmm. So the problem is not Islamic problem. The opera problem is, 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 is universal because no good governance in theory, as we want it to be, that is the benchmark, mm -hmm. can always be achieved. We can mark periods here, in, in, and, and my good colleague here did mark some, some hinted at this, and we have good periods, and we, they are well noted, and we have also very good periods in Islamic history. We can, and we are not talking about the Rashidun period alone, we can talk about other caliphs later, as, as, as Omar al-Thani, and, and many others later, and many sultans who were uh, exemplary uh, rulers, mm -hmm. exemplary in every sense of the word. We actually, they become part of the, of the, of the traditional historic seerah of Muslims. Salah al-Din, for example, was one of them, just to, to, to annotate what I'm saying. And so, the, 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 the Muslims today are actually uh, in buying, because they are going through, in the last 40, 50 years in particular, they are going through a process of liberalization that needs to be studied, it has not been studied yet. A process of liberalization to such an extent that part, an essential part of this process is to increase and intensify and thicken the Orientalist narrative about them. In other words, they are becoming more Orientalist subjects than before. Instead of we going into, 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 into liberation in post-coloniality mm. and hopefully post-modernity, in fact, the Muslim subject, generally speaking, is regressing towards more liberalism and therefore discoloring of one's history. So now, for example, 30 years ago, and, and, and there, is, there is some virtue in living and being a scholar for that long. I started very early, so I've been in this business for 45 years. Only about 25 years ago, Muslims in their history began to say, the ulama hijacked uh, Islamic history. The ulama uh, the, replicating what Europe says about its own church. But before that, they didn't say anything. Suddenly now, they are hijacking Islamic history. Why didn't you say this two centuries ago, three centuries ago, but now? after you get liberalized so much that you are absorbing West, Western history as a paradigm for yourself. Mm. So we cannot, and every time I have this challenge with my West Muslim audiences, is that what about the sultans? 
well, what about the Trumps? What about it? it, it that is not an argument. This is a non argument. As for the rule of law, I agree totally with you that, that, uh, that uh, uh, there were many abuses and that not every rule of law is, and this continues the point I made before. Uh, of course, Nazi Germany was, a, officially, formally speaking, was a state of rule of law. Israel is a state of rule of law. And we know what these people, these states are doing. And, 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 or, or in the case of, of, of the Nazis, were doing. Uh, so the rule of law, I agree with you, does not say much about this. What matters is the content of the law and what you do with it. Two things, the content of the law and what you do with it, what you can do with it systemically, meaning what the system allows you to do with the content of the law. Modern law, as I have argued in this particular book, this impossible state, modern law separates between ethics and law. Ethics can, law can never learn from ethics as an independent, especially if it is as an autonomous and grandfather or a, or a parental doctrine. In other words, morality and ethics cannot be the sources of the law. In Islam, it is exactly that, that morality and ethics are the source of the law. The Sharia is a moral system that articulates its morality in concrete terms through legal uh, instruments. That's what it is. It's not legal primarily. It is heavily legal, but not primarily. And so, the content of the law is is, is, is not just a matter of, of, uh, of uh, historical judgment of idealization. If you look at the social constitution of the jurists who made Islamic law, and Islamic law was formed, the fiqh was formed in basically in the first two centuries of Islam. We know that by Shafi'i, who died in 204 Hijri, the substantive law in Islam was uh, nearly complete. It started evolving, of course, and changing, but the body of the law as operative body of law that serves society wholly without parts being missing was complete by about Shafi'i's time, when he was mature. If you look at the social, social strata, uh, strata of, of the jurists, where they came from, the people who wrote the fiqh themselves, uh, itself, they were carpenters, uh, blacksmiths, leather tanners, uh, all sorts of professions that are considered to be somewhere in our language today, middle, middle, lower class, if not lower class. Including non-Arabs. Including everybody. Right. Yeah, yeah. What I mean is that the, Umayyad, the idea of the uh, Umayyad conspiracy, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to hijack your point, uh, but, but the suggestion that it's the, um the Umayyads uh, may have determined course of the law is uh, not believed even by Orientalists, uh, yeah. right? And, and, and certainly no one, uh, I wasn't alluding to uh, Umayyad conspiracy, I was simply uh, exploring the idea of, uh, of the Islamic, uh, Islamic um, polity not being a unitary state. And so I was just exploring the question right. of, of the, the influence of executive power on the formulation of legal discourse. That's right. all, so, right. so no conspiracies were be, right. being right. suggested. Right. It's just that the idea that we, I think it may be naive for us to, to think that, that there was an absolute separation between... Uh, well, that's, that's, that's my, my second yes. point to this, is that it, it was formed, in Islamic law generally, is Sharia is, 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 is extremely egalitarian compared to any modern law that I know. Uh, and this is why it was essential for the colonialists when they hit the ground in the 19th century. It was essential for them to remove the Sharia first thing. This is why they did all the reforms to, 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 to extricate the Sharia from its context. Because the Sharia could not give them their free market, their capitalism, their, their, their practices of, of, of capitalism, which involved, for example, hoarding. Hoarding is an important economic concept, one of the central concepts of what, how to make money and, and, and build wealth. In the Sharia, as we all know, it is punished severely. And all sultans I know of, every account where hoarding was reported to a sultan, I don't know one sultan who did not act on it and sent people to punish the, the, the hoarders. Capitalism is based on hoarding. It, it, without hoarding, it cannot live 
and we can see it now everywhere. I mean, I, I traveled to the, through the airport yesterday, and all I could see is, 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 is an airports are getting actually more and more atrocious, representing capitalism. <coughs> I always read the airports as books, because they are full of symbols of capitalism. It's getting worse. By the month, I, well, I haven't traveled because of COVID for some time, so, but now, I, with, with, with almost two years of, of non-travel, it is shocking me. So, so um, mm -hmm. that's uh, besides the point. But the, the, the idea here is that, that, that I agree with you that there were, that of course, there were exceptions and there were malpractices, etc. But, but the rule of law in Islam has, first, an egalitarian substrate that, that, that was made, was written, was constructed by Jews who were actually of the poorer strata of society rather than the richer. It was not made by the aristocracy, by the state. Marx would have, ba went, would have gone bankrupt. <laughs> All his projects would not have worked, obviously, if he were to, 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 to want to write the Das Kapital uh, about Islam, because it's just not going to work, right? And so the content, the content is there. And, and what can you do with it is the, what the Sharia itself as a political system meaning the constraints that it's put on the rulers, that actually no ruler, and this is my final point, but the crucial point, no ruler could come and say, I don't care, I'm going to replace the Sharia with my own rule. No one could do that. Right, so Professor Giannotti's couple of points, uh, I think the first one, that just a continuation of that, I think it's um, the going opinion in the field until recently, Patricia Cronus, for example, has been that the jurists usurped the authority of the executive, the caliphs, so much so that effectively that was for her and for people of her generation the reason why Islamic caliphate could not sustain the kind of power that other empires could for a while. And my own research is in, in this area, the current book that I'm writing on the Umayyad period, and I argue that um, just by the fact, as the fact that Professor Halak mentioned, Islamic law is actually being written. If you look at who is writing, it's Iraq, which is anti Umayyad, Medina, neutral to hostile, right? It's not Syria. Mm -hmm. And Syria is what the Umayyads have. But who is writing history? Iraq. Who is writing, where does Hadith come from? Medina and Iraq. It's in Syria, but mostly Medina and Iraq. So the idea, in fact, the, the, the going opinion in the field is that it is anti-state. Um, but it's not quite the same. My own opinion is that there is a lot more. Uh, the idea that the Umayyads, and, that Muawiyah and others are trying to usurp or harm Islam is actually a, a vast period of propaganda. Modern scholarship on the Umayyads shows actually that they were, in many ways, just as religious as the Abbasids. They were anti-Ali, so they had some problems, and they were sometimes exploitative, but they were, in some ways, far more egalitarian than the Abbasids, even though they, they used Islam less because they took it for granted. They were Arab nativists, right? There's one thing that we can agree on. The Umayyads were Arab nativists because they thought that was necessary for Islam to flourish. But, if you look at nearly all the major jurists in their time, including Qadis, that Yusuf, the Hajjaj himself, Hajjaj bin Yusuf appointed, you have people like Jubair, uh, Sa'id ibn Jubair, who is later executed by him, was actually appointed as a Qadi by him, who's a non-Arab. And majority of the jurists are, or in this generation, are non-Arabs and from non-elite. So my point is, uh, just to reinforce mm -hmm. what Dr. Professor Halak is saying, that you indeed uh, Islamic law develops almost as a uh, outside and sometimes in protest uh, to the uh, Umayyad authorities. The second point which I, uh, that I haven't spoken to, which is how complete is our rupture today so that can we even use the language of Islamic law? Um, and I think that uh, and, and this is where perhaps I, I disagree with uh, Professor Halak a little bit. I don't think that Islamic law, uh, the rupture is so complete that we cannot recognize what existed before. That in fact, 
I think in some ways our awareness of Islamic law, the number of people who are literate, the number of books that are available to us, the, the uh, access to printed works, for example, to a typical scholar uh, in any of madrasas, or even to us, is enormously greater than it was uh, even in the late colonial or before colonial period. So in some ways, we are seeing the history open up to us. And, and I think that, that is, there is great <clears throat> uh, room for optimism. In fact, the kind of work Professor Halak is doing uh, is possible precisely because of the work of these great editors, um, these unnamed, unsung heroes of the Muslim world, the ulama, who are printing these works, and their availability is changing the way we look at the past. <clears throat>